Good morning. It's good to see all of you. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. And I want us to read verses 1 through 21. Luke 2, verses 1 through 21. Hear now the word of the true and living God. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those who with whom, he is well, with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, and Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let us pray. Indeed, Father, as we focus our attention on this holy night, this divine night when Christ was born, we pray that we would not only see the rich history that is here, because these are historical events, but also that we would get a glimpse of the glory of Christ as it is revealed when He is born. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we conclude our series, Good News for Christmas. And again, the the premise has been that there's a lot of bad news in the world. We we want some good news and to to focus our minds and our hearts on, on good news. The week after Thanksgiving, we looked at, we called it, some people call it the fifth gospel, the book of Isaiah, because it is a a prophetic book that is rich with whole chapters even that point to the Messiah. And and we spent time just on two verses in Luke chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, uh, and, and saw there that there is a lot said about Christ as king. He would be a prince of peace. The government would be upon his shoulders. Uh, his kingdom would be one that goes forevermore. And that set the trajectory for us, that the Messiah who was to come 
is going to be king. The next week we looked at the first gospel written, as we think of gospels, the gospel of Mark. And we saw there at the end of Mark chapter 10 how he heals a blind man, Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus joins the crowd of people that are walking with Jesus as he goes to Jerusalem. And in Mark chapter 11, he actually enters into Jerusalem with the people laying down their coats and the Hosanna, Hosanna, the palm branches and all this. Uh, But then he goes into Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and all the, the fanfare and all the pomp and circumstance that went along with Jesus entering the town has seemingly dissipated. This one who has led this new exodus with those who were once blind and and all those who he has healed and they're walking with him as part of this uh, great procession into Jerusalem. Jesus goes into the temple, looks around, and and leaves. We, We talked about that. But again, that theme of the king. Fast forward another week, and we spent time with some of the stories that the king told about his kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. Just two of them we looked at about how the kingdom, it's like treasure in a field. It's like a pearl of great price. And you will sell everything that you have just for the pleasure and the privilege of getting the thing that you most wanted, that you needed. And how the thing that we most want and need when it comes to the kingdom is God himself and Christ himself. And then last week, We looked at the Gospel of John. Just one verse. The end of his upper room discourse with his disciples. The verse right before he begins praying to the Father. John 16, verse 33. And we saw there that Jesus, he declared victory the night before he goes to the cross. The next morning he's going to be crucified. And he says, done deal. I have overcome. I have conquered the world. And we talked about what it means for Jesus to conquer the world, and even for him to conquer our lives. Which leaves Luke. In Luke chapter 2. And what we've been doing is, we've been following Jesus. Think about in the theater of your mind, like when you go to a movie, and you're watching the silver screen, and, and maybe in this movie they've been following the main character on screen for some time. They haven't really shown them yet. Or maybe they start at the feet and they begin to uh, uh, raise the camera up. They pan up until now we get a full view of the main character's face. And that first scene, that first image of the hero of the story. To a degree, that's what we've been doing. We went all the way back to Isaiah. We've, the camera's been panning behind him, following the king as we've gone along. And now... We come to Luke chapter 2, and the camera, now we get an up-close view of the face of this king. And what is unique is here is the king as a baby. We look upon the face of this king, and he's a child. We, parents, you, you know when, when a child is born, what a what a joyous occasion that is. Uh, it, and, and when you look upon the face of that child and you, you hold that baby in your arms, you have all these hopes and dreams and, and what, what kind of child will this be? The thing is, in Luke's Gospel, we've been told. Mary has been told. Zechariah has been told. They've sang songs about it. Luke chapter 1 is all about this. And I invite you to go back and read the 80-some-odd verses of Luke chapter 1 this week as you consider some of these things and reflect on these things this week. All of the hopes and the dreams of the people of Israel, but also all the hopes and dreams of the Gentile people. The hopes and dreams of the whole world. Jews and Gentiles are on this one baby. Luke is a first-rate historian. In fact, just if you turn back a page or two to chapter 1 and just read the opening verses, you get an idea of how Luke, he's, he's writing a straightforward historical narrative. Inasmuch, verse 1 of chapter 1, inasmuch 
as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. You see, Luke, this is not just pie in the sky. I'm going to spin and weave this story together. You, you listen, he, he goes, he's talking about eyewitnesses there in verse 2. Ministers of the word, they delivered them to us. He talks about how he has followed all things very closely for some time. Again, this wasn't just a whim. I think I'll do this now. Luke spent time. He went to the original sources. He talked with the eyewitnesses. I'm persuaded he probably talked with Mary as well. Just based on some of the things that he writes about Mary, pondering these things. She kept them safe in her heart. And now, I'm going to write this orderly account. I'm not just going to throw this thing together slipshod. It is... And, and so... With that, as the preface to the Gospel of Luke, when you come to chapter 2, it's no surprise he starts throwing out names. Caesar Augustus. He's, over, he's the emperor over in Rome. Quirinius. He's governor over in Syria. This is actual, factual history. does the same thing, by the way, at the beginning of chapter 3. Uh, verse 1, Luke 3, 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Itria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. That's a time stamp. Here's this moment in history where you have all these guys, all these rulers in these various territories. Oh, and by the way, let's put a time stamp on this in terms of who, who are the Jewish rulers? Who, who's, who's the high priest at this time? Again, you don't write this way unless you know whereof you speak. Unless you've gone in and done the research and you know, and you can put time stamps on this, which is significant because Quirinius. For some time, there was the argument, the challenge from the skeptical folks that, well, the Bible isn't accurate because Quirinius, we can't find this guy. There's no historical data. Luke made him up. Or something, I don't know. And for a while, that, that was the argument, was we can't find Quirinius. Or at least, if we can find Quirinius, he was not governor at the time that Luke is saying he was governor. So, Luke was wrong. But as the archaeologist trial continues to dig, guess what they found? Quirinius actually served twice as governor in Syria. And what is in view here with this first registration, guess what? That's the first time he was the governor. And wouldn't you know it, the time stamp for this, well, it's, it's exactly when Christ was born. Again, Luke is writing history, and he's doing so accurately. Caesar Augustus, he's the emperor in Rome. And what is fascinating is, listen, Augustus has no intention of doing what, what the God of the Jewish people wants done. He doesn't know about Joseph and Mary. He doesn't know about the angelic visitations. He's just doing what rulers do. I'm going to count my people. Census time. And so he issues this decree from Rome. But even in the intentions and desires of this earthly ruler, guess what God is doing? He's accomplishing his purposes because he has said, God has said in the book of Micah that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. So how do you get Joseph and Mary a hundred miles down to Bethlehem? You get the emperor to issue a decree. He's merely acting according to his own desires and intentions of his heart, and yet God is accomplishing his purposes in the very same thing. How wise is our God? And by the way, Nazareth to Bethlehem, like I said, is 100 miles. No planes, trains, and automobiles. And that, was a, that was a tough trip. But they make it down to Bethlehem. That's where you had to go when it was time for census time. You had to go to your hometown. That's where they're from. And they show up, and Mary, she gave birth to her firstborn son. There's emphasis. Luke has emphasized 
uh, earlier, Mary, I'm, I'm not known a man. How are these things supposed to happen? And now uh, here is Luke uh, accentuating once again the virgin birth of Christ while also emphasizing here she's going to have other kids. This whole perpetual virginity thing that is promoted by our Catholic friends, say, it has no scriptural basis. Go back and read. Well, we can take a peek at it because it's just a few pages back. Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. Mark 6 and verse 3 talks about how uh, the, the people were wondering, they're questioning, is not this the carpenter's son, excuse me, the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? Jesus had other brothers and sisters. He's the firstborn. He's the oldest, which makes sense given the circumstances. But again, all this is Luke, very straightforward accounting of time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth. This is significant also because a little later on, after Luke and the first century the, the whole writing of the New Testament is done. Centuries after that, you do have guys who, well, they want some fame and claim too. And they begin to write their own little gospel narratives. And there's what's called the Proto-Evangelion of James. This is a, a Gnostic writing written centuries after the birth of Christ. And it claims to give the birth narrative of Jesus. You know how it differs from Luke's account? When it's time for Mary to give birth, there's a brilliant bright light. And then as the light fades, there's little baby Jesus. Very different. Which, by the way, that this is one of the documents that, again, not to pick on our Catholic friends, but this is one of the documents that they appeal to when arguing for the perpetual virginity of Mary and all that. Because you have this kind of teleportation, transportation of the baby out of the womb into the world. And so that's how you maintain Mary and all that. The thing is, again, number one, it's, a very, it's clearly a Gnostic work. And the Gnostics who were there, we did a whole series on First John where we talked about these guys who were running around claiming to have special revelation, special knowledge, because I've had this experience in the ether realm, and I've had the contact with these high spiritual beings, and they've given me this revelation. But for the low, low price of X number of dollars, I can share it with you. And so these guys were claiming to have special knowledge. Well, they also wrote stuff. And one of them was, again, the Proto-Evangelion of James, which, again, very different from Luke, who closely investigated these things. And so what do you get? Jesus is born in a, the, the usual way. Everything you see here are, is, is God using these ordinary means to bring his son into the world at the precise time and in the location he needs him to be. You need him down in Bethlehem while his mom and dad are up in Nazareth. King issues a decree. Just doing what a king does. Gets him down to Bethlehem. And then everything that goes along with a birth, that's what happened to our Lord. No brilliant white light, teleportation out of the womb, any of that. He's born just as any other baby. Again, I, I, I emphasize this because the Christian faith is not just kind of this ethereal, you know, intangible type thing. God rooted the gospel in history. This is, these are historical facts. The virgin birth is a historical fact. That miraculous supernatural thing, that's a historical fact. That's how Christ came into the world. But then also, as we go along, God is presenting these contrasts. God doesn't do things the way that we think He should. He doesn't do things the way that we would invent them. One time, I think I've shared this story before, but I was studying with a, a man who's a self-proclaimed atheist, and he was saying that if I were to do this, I would do thus and such. We were talking specifically about Scripture and the preservation of God's Word across time and space. And he says, well, why doesn't, if, if I were God, I would have done it in like steel plates or titanium plates or something that would have lasted forever. That's not the way God does things. He operates through ordinary means. 
And, and that's what we see God doing here, but it's also in order to bring out the contrast. For example, when God brings his son into the world who is going to be king of the world, we might think that a good script would be, well, obviously you want him born in a palace with all of the privileges and luxuries that go along with being the king. And then, you know, he's brought up in the palace and he learns how to be king and all that. And so but that's not the way God does it. His son, King Jesus, is born in this dusty backwater town of Bethlehem to common folk who are apparently on the poverty level. When they show up and present Jesus at the temple, they bring the offering of the poor. And, he, and, and when God's son, King Jesus, is born into the world, it's basic, It's in a barn, and he's placed in a manger. Again, God doesn't do things the way that we think he should. He doesn't operate. His thinking is not our thinking. And all this also brings out the contrast in the earthly kings that are there, Augustus and Quirinius, these earthly rulers, and the eternal king, Jesus. You see, again, you have Augustus. The emperor of Rome, no doubt with all of the privileges and prerogatives that go along with being the emperor of Rome. All of the luxury that one could ask for. And then here's King Jesus born in a very ordinary way, wrapped in swaddling cloths, placed in a manger. Or we could talk about Quirinius. He's got the, the whole governing of the area of Syria that goes along with that. But then here is King Jesus. And on his shoulders will be the government. Again, just these, these contrasts that stand out. The other thing is, the angels and the angelic appearances. So far in Luke's gospel, again, they've just been to common people. Just a man on the street. Folks like you and me. Mary. Zechariah. John the Baptist's daddy. And now... The angels show up and they announce the birth of Christ to shepherds. Not to sovereigns, to shepherds. Shepherds who, shepherding was despised work. It was often the work that was left for the youngest in the family because nobody else in the family wanted to do it. So it got kicked all the way down to the baby, all right? The youngest in the family would do it. Shepherds were typically seen as untrustworthy. According to Jewish law, they could not testify in court. That's how despised they were. And yet, these are the ones that God sends his angels. And when angels show up, by the way, it is a terrifying thing. People start losing control of bodily functions, pass out and all this stuff. Here, these shepherds, when notice verse 9. This angel appeared and you had the glory of the Lord shining all around them. They were filled with great fear. Terrified. And again, typically when angels show up and, and people experience fear... One of the first things that the angels have to say to these people is, don't be afraid. Fear not. Verse 10, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And then the angels, they end up going and seeing, let's go see this child. And they announce what they had seen out in the field. Again, these angels, they don't show up in Rome. They're not even up in Syria with Quirinius. They show up out in a field with shepherds while they're watching their flocks at night. Again, God doesn't do things the way that we think he should, which is also important when it comes to the cross. Because this baby is going to grow up. We talked about this. The baby born in a, in a box in a barn in Bethlehem is the one who grows up and dies on the cross for our sins. Again, how we would probably do it, it would be very different. Kind of an, a very clean, antiseptic type of approach. Not with all the gore and the blood and all that. And yet that is precisely how God determines to do it, is through the most torturous means of death ever invented by the fallen ma mind of men. And Christ is the one who endures that to redeem us. And by the way, he's the only one who could. 
This is the dilemma that we are faced. The great obstacle of our salvation. No human being could substitute for us because we're all fallen and sinners. And yet, in order to die, one must be human. On the other hand, the only one who can actually endure and satisfy fully the full wrath of God is God. You and I can't do that. How are we going to get it done? Well, we can. The triune God says, how are we going to get it done? And this is what is determined. The Father will send the Son into the world to be born by the way. Here is the beginning of the humiliation of the Son of God. Being born in backwater Bethlehem, With everything that goes along with that. And, and as we kind of move into this section here, it's hard for me to explain it because it's beyond our comprehension. But maybe we can just touch the hem of the garment here a little bit. Because Jesus is the solution to the dilemma that is ours because of sin. Because we need God to satisfy God. But we also need a human who can and is able to die in our place. And that's where Jesus comes in because Jesus is at once both God and man. 100% fully deity, 100% fully human. He is the God-man, and there's no confusion of that, no mixture of it. It's not that he's you know, part God but mostly human or part human and mostly God. Fully God, fully human, 100% God, 100% man, and again, this is the arithmetic of heaven. How do we know that this is the identity of Christ? Come with me to just a few passages as we think about this great mystery of the Incarnation. Our first stop is in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And Paul here is addressing his brothers in Philippi. And he is saying to them, you guys, you need... The church is a community where we're all looking up to one another. We don't look down on each other. We are to be humble there's supposed to be the spirit of humility. Let me prove it to you. And what he does, this is so fascinating. This is an illustration of the point he's making. Beginning in verse 5 and running through verse 11. And the illustration appears to be an early Christian hymn. A song that would have been sang in church. He's like, you guys sing this, don't you? Have the same mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, and, and this could be understood also as, though he existed eternally in the form of God. That's the force of this. He did not account, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. That is, he, Christ, emptied himself. No one emptied him for him. He did it himself. This was a voluntary, a willing action of the Son who existed eternally in the form of God. He emptied himself. How does he do that? By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, the, of God the Father. Did you hear it? Here is the, uh, the self-existent son. Well, what was it that, that Isaiah said? Remember this? I know it's been weeks, but... You go back and you read Isaiah 9 and verse 6, and you have all these titles that are used for Jesus, right? Prince of Peace, Mighty God. But there was one, Everlasting Father. And when we talked about that, I said that this should be understood as the Father of eternity. 
that Christ as the Son, as God in himself, he is the source of eternity. He is the Father of eternity. And it's the Father of eternity who becomes a baby. Wow. Right? He's, he's the self-existent Son who existed eternally. We can even say He exists eternally. And He's the one who entered time and space. Turn a few pages over to Colossians chapter 1. And we'll, we'll pick up the reading here in verse 15. Again, there, there are some who see here probably an, an early Christian creed, a statement of faith that was believed by the church. If you're going to be part of Christ's church, there's certain things you've got to believe, and here are some of them. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created. Notice that. He's the Creator. More than that, in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, ready, and for him. They exist for his good pleasure. And by the way, Paul is talking about Christ. He's talking about Jesus. Because he's just mentioned back in verses 13 and 14 how we've been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He's talking about Jesus. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's not only the creator, he's the one who sustains. He holds it all together. He's the... If you don't have Christ without Jesus, reality itself blips out of existence. This is foundational to reality itself. Because Christ is the one who holds it all together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is a, a, a very plain statement of the full deity of Christ. The whole fullness of God dwells bodily, ready, in this baby in a manger in Bethlehem. Are, are, you, are you getting it? Me neither, because it's, it's beyond comprehension. This is, again, the super condescension of the great and mighty God. This is what God determined to do from all eternity. That it would be the Son who comes into this realm. Again, the self-existent Son, the creator of the world, in the arms of His mother. Right across the page, Colossians 2 and verse 9, you get a, Paul doubles down on this. For in Him, he's talking about Christ, in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Again, everything that makes God, God, belongs to Jesus. Full deity. And at the same time, dwells bodily. Everything that makes us human. Except for sin. He's got that too. 100%. 100%. Fully God. Fully man. One more, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Ready? Here we go. We're gonna, this is the writer of Hebrews talking about the Son, Jesus whom he appointed, heir of all things, through whom he created the world. There it is again. The creator of the cosmos. Now an infant. 
the creator of water and everything that quenches our thirst, nursing at the bosom of his mother. He is, verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by his word, the word of his power. There it is again. He's holding all things together. He's upholding all things, sustaining everything by his powerful word. The one who upholds the universe by his word is now the infant that cries out from the manger. The ancient of days became an infant. The mighty God, born with everything that goes along with that. It doesn't get any deeper than that. This is the incarnation and the mystery of the incarnation. That God came near. God took on flesh to dwell among us. Luke 2 begins the uh, earthly life of Christ after his birth. He, of course, conceived in the womb. He's living there. But now he's been born, and now we will see as this child grows up and as he becomes a man and, and lives 33 years sinlessly, which we could never do. Doing that, by the way, his life, his active obedience, his righteousness, he does that so that it becomes our righteousness. That's the gospel as well. But then also to make purification for sin. That's the rest of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And he goes to the cross and he sheds his blood. That blood is what forgives us of every last sin of ours. We see the man on the cross dying in our place for our sins. Buried, but of course he doesn't remain buried. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. And after he makes purification for sin... He's ascended back to the Father's right hand where he lives and rules forevermore. And the Father, on, the, on behalf of the Son, is steadily conquering and driving back all of the enemies of the Son. He is making them his footstool. And once the last enemy is conquered, death, then comes the end. When... The son who was born in Bethlehem hands the kingdom back to the Father. God is all in all. The king is born. Here we are. We've, we pan the camera up, and there it is. There's his face. And he's a baby here. We fast forward. We see his face on the cross. Fast forward a little more. There's his face in glory. The exalted king who reigns forever and ever. The birth of a child, certainly a joyous occasion for any parent. But here is the good news of great joy for all the people. Let's commit this to prayer. <clears throat> Unto the only wise God be glory and honor and dominion and praise. We've only scratched the surface of what you, Father, did in sending your Son into this world. What Jesus did in taking on flesh, human nature, and yet by faith. We believe that Christ has done all of this through the humiliation of his birth, the supreme humiliation of his death, 
but also in the exaltation of his resurrection and ascension. All this on our behalf. And we thank you so much. We do so. In the name of Christ. Amen.